Welcome to the final Game Changer session of the World Circular Economy Forum 2021. Global system change, catalyzing forces for circularity. Pour commencer, je vais... To start, I will uh, turn over the floor to Ms. Kat Kate Daly, who will be moderating this session. The Center for the Circular Economy at Closed Loop Partners, a New York-based impact investment firm focused on the circular economy. Okay, Kate, what have you got planned for us today? Hi, Catherine. It's great to be here. And after the past two days of discussion on collaboration and leadership and action, we're now going to shift to an exploration of what needs to be done in the next five years and beyond to accelerate the transition to a prosperous and equitable low carbon circular economy. So we'll discuss some key enablers to unlock the value and scale of a circular economy from both the demand and supply perspective, including consumption, workforce readiness and skills transformation and discuss the role of finance and investment in making all of that possible. So we'll start today's session with an armchair dialogue, then we'll have a panel discussion and finally we'll open the floor up to audience questions. Ooh, j'ai tellement hâte. Ça a oh, I'm really exciting. Sounds great. I've uh, heard that some uh, great experts will be joining us. We have uh, Borgen So We're starting off with a very impressive trio representing three different perspectives. So we're joined today by Angela Paolini Allard, who is the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, as well as Steentje van Velthoven, who is Vice President and Regional Director for Europe at the World Resources Institute, and Guy Ryder, the Director General of the International Labor Organization. Organization. And then after that, we have a panel made up of Tim Brooks, the Vice President of Environmental Responsibility and the Sustainable Materials Center at the Lego Group, and Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. We also have Massimiano Tallini, a Global Head of Circular Economy for the Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center. And Bo will then come back to give us his takeaways. Okay, so it sounds like we have a very full hour ahead. And guess what, Kate? We're going to abandon you. We'll be watching from the wings, and we're going to hand this session over to you. A tanto. <laughs> Thank you, Angela and Stincha, for joining us today for a very important conversation. And before I jump into our discussion, I want to invite Bo Aganaba of Leading Change Canada to tell us what he sees as necessary if his generation is to experience a circular economy that is prosperous, inclusive, and equitable. So, Bo, we're relying on you to be the voice of your generation and tell us what should be our level of ambition. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'll certainly do my best uh, to be a representative of my generation. Uh, I want to start by saying it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here participating in this event, uh, hosting Canada, Canada for the first time. Um, I'm also calling in from the traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation peoples. Um, part of my role in Canada as an immigrant and as a settler on this land is to respect and affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. Um, and it's been encouraging for me to see Indigenous perspectives included in the discussions throughout the last couple of days. Um, as an organization that is future focused and change oriented and leading change, it is important that we understand the history and current realities of the land that we call home and that supporting Indigenous agency and leadership is a core value. So as the uh, executive director of a youth led and youth focused nonprofit, it's been uh, encouraging to also see youth voices included throughout these last couple of days as well. Um, I think my favorite aspect of, of my job is getting to interact and have conversations with incredible young people all, all over the country. Uh, yesterday we heard from Sophia, uh, Sophia Yang of Threading Change that she mentioned that young people don't have to wait for tomorrow to make a change, that it's already our time now. And I fully echo those sentiments. Um, you know, we have the enthusiasm, the flexibility, and dare I say the audacity that it takes to reimagine systems and the potential of our society. Um, so how do we empower ourselves and each other to contribute to the change that we want to see? Of course, this is a multifaceted question with a huge range of possible answers. But uh, in some of the conversations that I've had recently, a few things seem to stick out. Of course, education that can prepare young people for the jobs of tomorrow will be critical. 
Uh, many of the top, top jobs of today didn't exist a couple of decades ago, and that will continue to be the case going forward. So we need educational institutions that can reflect the changing nature of employment and careers. I think circularity is powerful because it have how it can frame some of our challenges in a more holistic way. And reducing some of those silos that exist uh, in education and often in the workplace as well uh, can encourage young people to collaborate and work across disciplines and sectors, which is going to be increasingly important. We heard a lot about collaboration in, in the last uh, session as well, and um, it certainly resonated with me. We'd also like to see uh, more jobs programs and investments centered around innovation, technology, and conservation. Uh, I recently read an article in The Guardian about how students are flocking to climate and environmentally related fields at unprecedented levels, including fields that have historically been unrelated to climate. Supporting these students for the jobs and careers that encourage and build upon that passion is going to be hugely important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, circularity can frame some of our challenges in a holistic way. This is powerful because it allows people to use their own passions and interests to learn more about the circular economy and how to get involved. Thank you, Bo. You've, you've started us, uh, us off with some really powerful and important themes. And I think that the idea of setting a common vision that allows for inclusivity and, and addresses all of the challenges that you mentioned is, is going to be paramount. And so, Angela and Steensha, turning over to you, what, in your view, does a fully functioning circular economy look like? And how can it support social and environmental progress in our world? And Angela, why don't we start with you? Well, great. Thank you so much, Kate. And Bo, that was really inspiring, I have to say. Um, so I'd like to take it in a bit of a different direction, looking um, more purely at the, at the economic and trade aspects of this and, and how we can achieve a circular economy that is global, uh, inclusive, and safe. Um, so specifically, um, I believe that making progress towards a circular economy is essential for achieving sustainable development. And it's a vital element in our efforts to mitigate and adapt uh, to climate change. As we know very well, population and economic growth are projected to lead to a doubling in global material consumption by 2060. And that surge in natural resource demand will increase greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental pressures. We know this. And all of this arises from the extraction and consumption and end of life management of such resources. So we have to place a priority from an economic and trade perspective on the efficient use of resources and the level of emission, emission reductions and the generation of high quality green jobs. So our vision has to be of a circular economy that is, like I said, global, inclusive, and safe. And for that, trade and the World Trade Organization play a very important role. So in a global uh, circular economy, open trade ensures that all countries have access to the goods, services, as well as the technologies that allow them to produce and consume resources in a more sustainable manner. In an inclusive circular economy, trade ensures that the circular economy benefits rich and poor countries alike. Trade helps to make participation in the circular economy affordable and can create opportunities for jobs and economic diversification in developing countries. So establishing new circular sectors and activities such as waste management, repair, maintenance, remanufacturing, and recycling. We can also, through trade, diversify a country's export industries by promoting trade in secondary raw materials and high value added industrial waste. And then finally, in a safe circular economy, trade goes hand in hand with actions to reduce the threats to human health or the environment associated with linear economic approaches. So governments have to act collectively to avoid potential pitfalls of un illegal or unregulated trade in waste that can undermine the circular economy. So we have to work collectively to curb illicit trade. So the WTO rules and structure are helping us to get to a good place on these issues and more can be done on these issues. Thanks, Angela. And, and Steencha, I'd love to hear your perspective as well on how circularity can support 
and social and environmental progress. Thank you so much. And con congratulations to Canada and Citra for a fantastic WCEF. Uh, and I also have to say, Bo, really inspiring. I think what we need to do is ensure that the, we, we generate the, the opportunities, we conserve the opportunities for future generations in that context of doubling of consumption, which is mentioned by Angela. So, so what does a fully functional, fully functioning circular economy look like? It's a, it's an economy which basically con con constantly regenerates itself, where we keep materials and products at their highest value through increased circularity, refuse unnecessary use of material, so design out unnecessary use, but when you do use, reuse, repair, remanufacture, and at last resort only recycle. And this is not a nice to do; it is really a need to do. To give, to give some figures. Um, the supply of energy and its consumption in buildings and transport together generates 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The remaining 45%, so nearly half, is directly linked to the production of goods as well as the management of land. So if Angela says you know, it will lead to this higher consumption will lead to higher greenhouse gases, it's, it's bigger than we think, than most people think. It's nearly half. So changing the way we make and use products can contribute to addressing 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And, and also with the trade organizations that should resonate, it's good for the economy because it both strengthens economic resilience by reducing our reliance on scarce resources. And it offers a 4.5 trillion economic opportunity by avoiding waste, making business more efficient and creating new employment opportunities. Waste actually is literally a waste of time, money, and also human resources. So by creating a circular economy, we create a stronger system and flatten or even reverse some trends that now threaten the existence of future generations. So there's a huge task ahead of us, but it can be done. A uh, fully functioning circular economy, of course, needs to be guided by a global, global roadmap. And this is exactly what PACE the platform for the acceleration of the circular economy has, has drafted. The action agendas launched earlier this year provide an impact analysis and calls for action for circular transitions in five important value chains. Uh, we need this kind of an agenda to know what we have to do, but also to track if we are doing all we need to do and if we are doing it with sufficient speed and at large enough scale. So uh, uh, I think there's an enormous task ahead of us, but there are also documents now guiding us uh, in this important transition. Thanks, Tincha. And I think building on, on Bo's points and really thinking about the, the level of urgency that we need to bring to this multi-generational effort, um, systems change is complex and it's gonna take all of us pulling in the same direction. Let's talk about what is our level of ambition and what do we need to have in place in order to advance that kind of systemic transition from the, the, the perils of our linear economy to a circular economy on a global scale. And, and Stincha, I'll hand it back over to you to continue those thoughts. Well, thanks so much. And uh, like I said, the, 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 the challenge is huge. Uh, so we need this global roadmap. We also need ambitious goals and targets that guide the circular transition and to which we can also hold ourselves accountable. We know that there are lots of projects ongoing, but is it enough? Is it structured enough? Is it scalable enough? And the NDCs are the global commitment infrastructure for climate. And I think we need the same for circular economy. And it's fantastic to see that in 66 NDCs, circular economy is now being taken up as part of this. And it's really possible. There are some very good examples. If you look what's happening around the global plastic pact, if you count back from 2050, you need to be on a strong growth path in order to, revert, to reach the target of net zero carbon by 2050 uh, and build climate neutral and inclusive economies. So an ambitious goal, I think, is both the driver and the benchmark of global commitments to see if we are moving fast enough and we're going far enough. And of course, to, to, to do all this, we also need global collaborative instruments in place. So global conveners such as the WCEF, GASERE, uh, or the WEF and PACE, I think, are crucial support dialogues between governments, businesses, civil society and academia to agree on policies and regulations that incentivize those circular value chains, remove barriers, trade barriers, for example, and also scale back best practices. Um, in my former role uh, as a Minister for the Environment for the Netherlands, I launched the European Plastic Pact with my colleagues, Brun Poisson and Lea Wermeling from Denmark. And so I know from experience how difficult it is to collaborate across countries and sectors. So we really need expert conveners to support these collaborative actors because there's no point in doing it just in one country. 
We need to do it in groups, in sectors. You need to become scalable movements. So lastly, what we need is the global knowledge infrastructure. We need research and data to present the facts, to have clear baselines where we are now, where we need to be in five and 10 years, clear pathways and action to take there. Again, there, I think uh, the, the, the action agenda produced by PACE is an example, but there are fantastic research being done by the Anna MacArthur Foundation, by the International Resource Panel, Circular Economy, Citra, all generating knowledge on the circular economy and climate or see in biodiversity. So I think there in the generation of data and creation of this global knowledge infrastructure with all these partners, I think we really have a very important task there too. That's great. Thanks, Deitra. And it's a tall order, right? A, a global information and network infrastructure to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts and that we're all driving toward a shared common vision. Angela, what's your perspective on how we transition quickly and systemically? Well, I, I just, uh, I think Steve really set me up perfectly to answer that question um, because some of the things that she raised are, are really very much on point um, in terms of the work that the World Trade Organization does. Um, so WTO rules on trade are a really good place to start because they further the ambition of governments to promote in environmental sustainability and to pursue circular economy strategies. So WTO rules focus on more than just removing trade barriers. Sustainable development is an objective of the multilateral trading system, which is included in the, in the agreement that established the WTO in the first place 25 years ago. So WTO rules give members ample policy space to pursue environmental and other legitimate goals while keeping protectionism in check. Sometimes people don't realize that, that that aspect of the WTO is that we give that kind of policy space. And WTO rules can help governments develop better environmental regulations and promote coherent and holistic approaches to circular economy and sustainability. So first of all, the WTO promotes transparency, and that's absolutely essential to reaching good policy outcomes. So the WTO includes mechanisms that inform on policy measures taken by governments. So governments are required to notify new technical regulations for which there is no international standard, and that may have a significant effect on trade. And WTO also provides for comprehensive periodic trade policy reviews of its members. So these transparency efforts are all great opportunities. And you know, we, we, were, we were talking about uh, uh, getting data. Well, the WTO has an environmental database that gathers environment-related trade measures of its members, such as government support, technical regulations, and conformity assessment procedures, and trade bans and licensing requirements. The WTO also promotes policy dialogues that foster a better collective understanding and, and collaboration on these issues. So we have a WTO committee on trade and environment that provides governments a dedicated forum for discussing the interlinkages between trade and environmental sustainability and developing new and creative ideas to solve problems. We've looked at trade aspects of domestic initiatives on waste and chemicals management extended producer responsibility and recycling, and support to developing countries to facilitate their participation in e-waste recycling value chains. So complementary policy dialogues on circular economy issues are also taking place under two new initiatives uh, launched uh, very recently. So we have the Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structured Discussions, that's 53 of our members, to promote the sharing of trade-related best practices and collaboration um, among our members to advance work on a more resource-efficient circular economy, sustainable supply chains, et cetera. We also have an informal dialogue on plastics pollution. Um, it, we just had a big meeting uh, at the WTO about this with discussions on the circular economy covering the constructive role of trade in, in addressing barriers to uh, plastic in, in plastic waste and scrap. But we need more. We absolutely need to have more ambition. Harmonization in regulations and the adoption of international standards 
facilitates trades and promotes this particular objective. So we, we need more uh, ambition also in reducing barriers to trade in environmental goods and services both. More open trade would spur the deployment of advanced technologies that allow countries to improve resource and energy efficiency, to replace traditional inputs with renewable or recovered goods, and manage solid and hazardous waste. An integrated global market, it takes more than just one country, it takes everyone, and it makes technological solutions that support the circular economy more affordable and is a driver of innovation. Trade allows businesses to utilize economies of scale and to come up with creative and innovative new ideas. So we've come a long way, but there's more to do. Thanks, Angela. And, and many of the issues that, that you just raised and that Stincha and Bo touched upon as well are, of course, inextricably tied to the future of work and the jobs of the future. And so now I think we'd like to take a moment to share a video message from the Director General of the International Labour Organization, Guy Ryder. Thank you for inviting the ILO to be part of the World Circular Economy Forum. As we all know, the time for tackling the damage caused by climate change is running out. So there's no better moment than now to discuss circularity. The circular economy creates tremendous opportunities in the world of work. The ILO estimates that 78 million new jobs could be created if our economies became circular. But our research also shows that 71 million jobs could be lost as well. So with so many millions of jobs at stake, the transition towards this circular economy needs to be a just transition. And that means a transition based on social justice and decent work for all. To ensure that social and environmental progress go hand in hand, we must start valuing properly the people that make the circular economy work. And that will be no easy process. Let's remember that the majority of people that repair, refurbish and recycle today work in the informal economy, often in unsafe working conditions, with limited opportunities to improve their livelihoods. As they exist today, these are certainly not the types of jobs that we want to see more of in the future. And what will happen to the workers who lose their jobs during the transition? Well, the ILO's latest World Social Protection Report shows that only two out of 10 unemployed workers now receive any unemployment benefit at all. And so we urgently need to step up investments in social protection floors for everybody. And we need massive investments in forward-looking skills strategies and other active labour market policies. We need to reskill the existing workforce and to train young people for the future jobs that will power the circular economy. And it's equally important that we create an enabling environment for sustainable enterprises of all sizes, in particular, the small and micro enterprises that today struggle to fulfill their potential in the informal economy. And in doing all of this, we need to consider how our actions will affect the entire world of work we must ensure that no one is left behind. For a start, we need to advance gender equality and inclusion in all aspects of the circular economy. Otherwise, we simply risk recycling the discriminatory stereotypes and gender pay gaps that persist and disfigure our economy today. These considerations are just the beginning. A lot needs to be done. The ILO's tripartite constituents have adopted guidelines for a just transition towards sustainable, environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all. And these provide a powerful roadmap for navigating the challenges and the opportunities ahead. I've no doubt that we can bring about a circular economy in our lifetimes and that we need to do so. But if we are to ensure a just transition to that circular economy, we must engage those with most at stake and those with the power to bring about systemic change in the world of work. Governments, workers and employers. Let me be clear, the circular economy simply won't function without the commitment 
and the involvement of workers and employers. And we will never achieve our goal of catalyzing change without government support at the global, the regional, the national and the local level. To do all of this, we need to stop working in silos. The circular economy is not a single issue agenda. It must be pursued and coordinated across ministries of labor, of education, of industry, of trade, and of finance to name but a few. We need global solidarity, increased cooperation, and we need innovative partnerships. So let me conclude by saying that the ILO is fully committed to this ambitious agenda for change. With our centenary declaration for the future of work and our recently adopted global call to action for human-centered recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, we are perhaps better prepared than ever to contribute to shaping a greener and inclusive circular economy that works for us all. And our last question relates to the theme of this year's conference and keeping in mind Guy's call for a just transition to a circular economy. Let's talk about what are the game changing drivers and enablers that we most need to focus on. And Angela, let's start with you. Okay, well, that is, uh, we, we have to come up with a prescription. We can't just show the problem. So I'm glad you, you've, uh, you've asked that question. And um, I, I can once again speak from, from the, the perspective of, of how we can deal with this through trade and through the work of the World Trade Organization. Because I think we're really well positioned to create trade policies that would better incorporate resource efficiency and other aspects of the circular economy. So improving traceability of products and materials throughout the product life cycle, developing better global definitions and standards, um, and fostering trade facilitation and better cooperation between domestic regulators, both within a country, but, but of course, um, more globally as well. All of that is needed to move to a circular economy that delivers health, environmental, economic, and worker benefits. So many trade-related measures don't distinguish between waste and reusable materials. That doesn't make sense and it doesn't help us achieve a circular economy. So it ends up happening that reusable materials get redirected from productive purposes, such as remanufacturing or recycling to the waste stream, exactly what we are trying to avoid. So we need to work on, on that in new and improved provisions under our harmonized system nomenclature or on, on uh, with respect to tariff nomenclature and in collaboration with the Basel Convention, among other uh, uh, items. We also need to address services restrictions. And this is not necessarily intuitive because when we think of the circular economy, we think of goods. But services is a huge important component of this because it has such an impact. Many aspects of the value chain, like repair, warranty recovery, redistribution, value recovery, end of life recycling, that's all powered by services. That includes R&D for product design, services for waste management, installation, assembly, testing, all of these things. And digital solutions and technological innovations have allowed the sharing of platforms and product service systems to emerge. So trade in services is needed for the circular economy to thrive. And then finally, we need to focus on strengthening the capacities of developing countries, and in particular, the least developed countries, to allow them to participate and benefit from the circular economy. And we would all benefit as a result. In this regard, aid for trade type support can provide a key role in helping countries build their productive capacities as well as standards and trade facilitation infrastructures to ensure that circular trade meets safety and quality requirements, minimizes the risk of illegal waste imports, facilitates the flow of legitimate products, and also contributes to decent work and movement from the informal sector uh, and into better jobs. So this is an area of ongoing work within the WTO and I just want to highlight that open trade and integration of trade and environment is really a key to success here. Thank you. 
Thanks, Angela. And and Stincha, over to you, thinking about how, how to prioritize which are the game-changing drivers that, that you would put at the top of your list. Well, I think Angela and I are very much on the same page. Again, I think uh, this also shows that there is convergence about where the real priorities lie. I'd say policy frameworks really are a crucial game-changing driver, and they're also crucial for a just transition, because indeed some jobs will be lost and not all can transition on their own to new jobs. So this focus on skills is incredibly important. And then we also need to create a market for low carbon products, for example, by using the procurement power that governments have to drive the circular economy. The World Bank calculates that public procurement amounts to 11 trillion out of global GDP of ne nearly 90 trillion. So 12% of global GDP is spent following procurement regulation. So it's actually a secret weapon to ach achieve the circular economy and that just transition. And of course, like it was mentioned before, trade policy is another example. I think sustainable supply chains are an enormous challenge. Secondary materials versus waste, services, all these things that Angela said, absolutely important. And then metrics, standards. We need a common language and related metrics to assess where we stand, what is efficient action, what we have to achieve. So they're essential for defining and measuring progress and performance. And none of us can do that alone. It's really something we need to work on all together. And then technology. You wouldn't perhaps necessarily think of a combination between circular economy and artificial intelligence, robotic, blockchain, etc. But it's going to be absolutely crucial because it will enable us to track and trace materials in our economies for optimal use and reuse. So an incredibly important link. And then four, we need to listen to the voices of diverse groups in each country and region when designing a circular economy. Not just the global industry leaders, um, we usually know how to find them, but also informal workers associations, waste collectors, indigenous economy youth, because the circular economy will only work if it is in the end equitable and people-centered. Thank you, Stincha. I think uh, all of our panelists would agree that, that in meeting the goal of a just transition, all of those issues are, are paramount. So many thanks to you both for your very thoughtful and insightful remarks. And now here to help us unpack what we just heard, a lot of really ambitious ideas and, and to help us set priorities are three panelists who represent very different perspectives, those of demand, supply, and scale up. So I'd like to welcome Tim, Sharon, and Max. Tim Brooks, of course, from Lego Group, Sharon Burrow of the International Trade Union Confederation, and Max Tellini of Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center. Welcome. So, Tim, let's start off with you. We, we just heard the perspectives from our armchair speakers on a transition to a circular economy. How, according to Lego Group, can consumption patterns drive a circular transition? And from your perspective, what is needed in the next five years to take steps toward changing consumption? Yeah, and thank you. And uh, thank you for, for having the Lego group on this uh, platform and, and to all the speakers already. I think, you know, you're right to start at the consumption end because that's, of course, what drives uh, the circular economy what, what, and what will drive it going forwards. I think we have been active on sustainable materials and, and increasingly so circular economy for, for many, many years and sort of invested quite heavily in this area. I think a couple of things we see uh, definitely, number one being the consumer journey and making it compelling and attractive for consumers. You know, I think there's, there's a, a mindset that somehow we will, uh, consumers will do something that they don't want to do. And that's obviously not the case. They have to want to do it. They have to see benefit in it. And there has to be a need that this solution, this circularity is answering. It has to answer a specific need that they have that linear, that the linear economy isn't answering and isn't fulfilling um, at the present time. So that could be increased convenience. It could be less clutter in their house. If you think about new business models and, and some of our products, um, you know, that might be a need that we could, we could answer for them um, that would encourage them to take part in a meaningful way through consumption and the circular economy. I think the one thing that we also feel very, very passionate about is uh, durability and compatibility. And of course, you'd expect that if you know the Lego group products, you know that we make 
bricks that fit together and they've fitted together since 1958. And I can't think of another product you can buy off the shelves today that fits together perfectly with something from the late 1950s. I can barely think of something that I bought uh, six months ago that still fits together, certainly not in the, in the digital um, space. And I think that's something that's really overlooked is the, the consumption relationship to durability long lasting and compatibility, making things that are simply made to last a long time. Of course, that's not possible for everything. We might not want our sneakers to last forever. Um, and we certainly don't want uh, some uh, uh, food and beverage items to last forever. Uh, so I think, um, you know, it's not it's not true for everything, but something about durability is, is really, really important. And we we to promote that durability and to promote the um, the, the the reloop of, of products. We've uh, launched a replay program in the U.S. and Canada, uh, where we take back our bricks. Um, we uh, ask our um, uh, fantastic fans and consumers. They can go to our website. They print off a label, put it on any box, fill it with bricks. We'll take them back, all paid, postage paid, and we'll clean them up and give them uh, to charities. So charities across the U.S and also uh, indigenous charities in Canada as well. And um, I think we've reached 66,000 children with that, with that program. And I think what we're trying to do is explore many, many different ways of how you can uh, reuse products in that way. And I think those loops are overlooked, that reuse loop. I mean, we, we keep sort of aiming towards recyclability all the time. And I think we need to think more about reuse be before we even consider recyclability. And that's one of the most common questions I get is how do you recycle Lego bricks? And, you know, I say, I don't want you to recycle them. I want you to reuse them. And it's, it's, a, it's a reframing of that. And then I think it's about changing be behaviors in general as well. We know the circular economy is possible. We know reuse is possible. If you buy a, a you know a car today, um, you might very well buy it from an authorized dealership of the original manufacturer of that car, um, and that's something that people don't bat an eyelid about. You go back to the manufacturer, you buy a secondhand car. Someone else will buy it. It will have multiple uses. And then at the end of the day, it will be recycled because it is a high value, a very much cherished um, item. And I think that that's a really important way of reframing it. A lot of this is not is not new. And it's really about having people think differently. And, you know, if there are concerns about buying those products from the manufacturer, I mean, this is something you get into and you drive at 100 kilometers an hour down the road. So we, we know it's possible. We know people can trust it if, if brands also can get behind it. Uh, I think there's a number of other things that need to change around legislation that's been talked in, in some markets. We can't sell toys made from recycled materials because of legislation. And that's something where we're working with those jurisdictions to overcome. There's technology that is involved. So when, if we want to explore new business models and potentially how we might uh, rent Lego bricks. I mean, I've got a set here. This is part of a world map set. Uh, you can't really tell which country it's from, but this is part of a bigger set and that has uh, 15,000 individual dots in it. So we would need to find a technology to take back those uh, products and those 15,000 uh, dots and unpick them and clean them up, etc. So a lot of barriers, a lot of uh, things that we are actively working to overcome. I think the final point I want to leave it on is we've just done a huge study with over 6,000 children and aligned with some of the other speakers. And we, we're talking to children about their attitude and, and knowledge of the circular economy, aligned with what other, some of the other speakers that also saying is we, you know, some of the most important things that came out of that study was the skill development and knowledge that is required at the ground level up with, with children still needs to be developed and, and certainly reframing those uh, consumption patterns and a general understanding of what it even means to be a circular economy. So a few things that we're touching on that, uh, and a few steps that we're also taking. Thanks, Tim. That's It's a great perspective on the, the demand side. And, and certainly with Legos, you, you can't have a better example of the circular principle of design for disassembly. So adding in durability and all the rest, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, Sharon, as, as we turn to really looking at the demand side of the market, the, the International Trade Union Confederation's mission is to promote and defend workers' rights and interests through international cooperation between trade unions, global campaigning, and advocacy. And I know that your institution looks at the economy through a human rights, equality, 
and non-discrimination lens. So having heard what Tim said about the demand side of the market, can we hear from you, how can labor representing the supply side of the market and decent work practices unlock a just transition to an inclusive circular system? So we talk about uh, the social contract and you heard Guy Ryder talk about much of that in the context of where are the jobs coming from, where will jobs of the future be, what jobs will transition and what conditions will they be indeed uh, uh, guaranteed. But we know and we started the fight for just transition a long time ago now, more than 15 years. And we said then, and we still maintain, there are simply no jobs on a dead planet. So we all have to reevaluate what the work of the future is. And I'm not just talking about technology, I'm talking about where we generate jobs, where we value work. So if you think about the huge challenge for climate, then it's simply the reality that circular economy practices will increasingly be part of every business model. Greenhouse gases, of course, uh, people have already talked about. But there's also the, the tipping points that say we have planetary boundaries that are simply dictating that we must either reuse or recycle as much as we can. And, uh, and indeed, we know that if you plan for that, there are jobs in the industries that are emerging, but there are also protection of jobs in the industries that are shifting. And so if you want to make a start somewhere and think about the impact it can have, then think about the 40 to 45 percent of emissions and the supply and demand that city planning can actually generate. If indeed we're going to move our cities to livable cities with the huge populations that exist there, then they sit at the centre of demand and supply. So when you heard people talk about both legislative governance and procurement, these can drive rapid, effective change. You can actually um, uh, uh, regulate the demand and supply frame to set new standards for reuse and recycling, but to also ensure just transition and decent work. It's very simple from our, our point of view. If you think about the industries of today, they'll largely be the industries of tomorrow. Construction, transport, agriculture, manufacturing, care, services. You know, you think about all of the things that we depend on, but the business planning must be different. So if you start with jobs from our perspective, which is at the heart of a, a, a social contract, then jobs, jobs and jobs, indeed climate friendly jobs with just transition must be right there. And as Guy Ryder said, they have to be decent work. So human and labour rights have to be part and parcel of the way we generate fair trade or the fair competition floor in business. And you need universal social protection with inclusion. And I was struck by the opening with um, the focus on Indigenous communities. If we really want to deal with uh, biodiversity and, uh, and, and forests, the health of our forests on which we all depend, then let's include the Indigenous people because they know more about the land on which uh, their ancestors have uh, indeed, uh, um, you know, uh, defended and lived in than most of us. So can I say to you that when you think about all those industries, there are two things to think about. One is, as we make the shift, is the shift just? And if unions, workers and their unions are at the table, if they're working with employers, if they have the support of governments, then you can make sure that just transition is real. What does it mean? It simply means that if jobs are at risk, can you actually provide secure pensions for older workers? Can you build a bridge to pension for those who aren't quite there yet, but would to make that choice to retire a little earlier? Can you invest in the income support, the skills support and the redeployment support to make sure workers can move to other jobs, good jobs? And of course, can we reinvest in communities to make sure we're not leaving people behind? We don't want stranded assets, but we actually don't want indeed stranded people or stranded communities either. 
It will take industry policy shifts, but it will also take the power of people having the courage to legislate and to use procurement. We know that there are jobs in all these areas. We just have to make the, uh, the decision to put people and planet together at the centre of a future business model and that will indeed have to maximise circular economy practices. I love it when young people say to me, if you can't reuse it or recycle it, then don't deploy it in the first place. I know it sounds too simple, but that's where we've got to get to, at least at the level of conscious decision making. And we have to be indeed absolutely understanding of the roadmap that you heard talked about earlier that incorporates a perspective from people and indeed make sure that we have a stable planet, which is our common home to live on. Thanks, Sharon. And, and thinking about the, the intersection that you note of workers, employers and government, then a, a, an obvious fourth addition to that is, is capital and, and investment that, that drives that system as well. So, so Max, I'll turn to you. Uh, because I know that Intesa San Paolo has, has taken a circular economy strategy to heart in its financial portfolio modeled by your circular economy credit facility. And in a recent collaboration with Botrone University and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that you published a white paper showing how the circular economy is actually a de-risking strategy for companies, for employers who are driving superior risk adjusted returns. Um, can you talk a little bit about which type of public private financial models we need in your view, if we're to catalyze a transition to the circular economy and really unlock it at scale? Hi, Kate. Hi, everybody, and I hope you can hear me well. First of all, many thanks for hosting us. Thanks to Citra and the Canada for this uh, amazing opportunity and for hosting such an exciting edition of the World Circular Economy Forum. I'm talking from Brussels, the heart of Europe. And as European citizens, I really need to say that I'm really proud of what Europe and European institutions are doing in order to lead the transition for a circular economy. Going back to your question, for sure, the research that we've been making with Bocconi University that you just mentioned and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been uh, somehow uh, confirming an approach that is part of the vision of the strategy of the top management of the bank. Uh, Intesa San Paolo has been uh, trying to nurture a new culture of supporting entrepreneurs in their search for business models uh, oriented and inspired by the circular economy principles. With the six euro credit billion facility, six euro billion credit facility that we have been putting forward, we have been assisting clients that wanted to shift their business models from linear ones or semi-linear to more circular ones. And there is for sure a sort of clear evidence on how paper use models are somehow taking uh, the uh, leading position in supporting also the change of uh, relationship with their clients. There is a clear understanding on how um, the uh, prolonging of the life shelf of products and the redesign of products themselves, as been said already by the other speakers, is peculiar and key in supporting companies in advancing and accelerating the transition to a very circular economy sort of business model. And not forget that for sure, there is also a clear understanding on how new materials can represent a source of inspiration for new ventures and for new ideas on doing business. For sure, in Italy, we have a, a clear examples of how industrial symbiosis is leading companies from different sectors to engage uh, with uh, um, other players along the value chains and also to create uh, somehow unexpected alliances in order to create even new products. Take, for example, a company working in the agri uh, business sector. And in the same region, there is another player working maybe in the utility sector. Well, from the interaction of the two, there has been uh, the chance to create a third company, which is now producing a sort of bio degradable polymer, which is a, a third sort of product compared to the two existing pre-existing um, sectors. So this is a clear uh, evidence on how 
innovation is key in supporting the transition and helping companies in understanding that there is value creation opportunities to be good and to be somehow even exploited on. If I may just uh, build on what has been said and also on these two amazing days of uh, um, sharing and uh, I would say um, uh, dialogue on the topic of the circularity, I would say that for sure Europe, as I was anticipating in the beginning, is for sure leading the conversation on this transition if we bear in mind that uh, for the next 10 years basically we need as europeans to add at least 350 billion euros annually of extra investment to achieve the um, emission of co2s on the other side i would say that innovation for sure can be seen as a driving factor for the transition to the circularity and working for the innovation center of the biggest italian bank the top three uh, among the, the top uh, three five um, banking um, financial institutions uh, in europe i can say that for sure innovation is somehow proving uh, pivotal in supporting the sort of uh, um, research and effort in creativity and in um, investing for innovative solutions that somehow can help even customers in being diversely engaged with the uh, companies. Take, for example, the paper use model. Take, for example, what's happening with the mobility, what's happening with the lighting, what's happening with the carpeting. There is a, a really fresh wave of innovation in the business model of companies. But this is part, I would say, from the beginning part of uh, the uh, supply part of the market. It's also important now to focus on how we also are able to support the demand of this um, equation. And I would say that collaboration and public-private partnerships, specifically coming out of the pandemic emergency, is going to be even more crucial than before. And thanks to the um, uh, recovery and resilience facility that the European institution been putting forward, we believe there is a great opportunities for financiers and companies to be able now to shift the conversation and create a regenerative economy, which is a collective action for change. Thanks, Max. That's that's great to hear. And certainly the, the idea of investment in innovation, as we look at that intersection of government and employee, employer, how do we make sure that, that those investments in future innovation align with the job market, with this upskilling that's needed, and looking at all of the, the trade issues that, that we've discussed as well. So I think before we turn to questions from the audience for our panelists, let's bring <coughs> Bo back in to give us who's two top takeaways from everything that we've heard so far. Bo, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this has been super fascinating to to listen to. It's very hard for me to try and pick two um, out of everything that I've heard, but I'll certainly do my best. Uh, I think one that sticks out to me is, uh, you know, protections for labor and thinking about how we can ensure that there's a just transition um, with bringing labor on board. Um, you know, it's difficult for people to be uh, ambitious and creative in thinking about creating new companies um, and things like this when, you know, they're insecure about their own jobs. So I'd love to see some kind of, um, you know, safety net around worker protections and things like that uh, so that we can bring uh, more people along with us um, into this transition. Um, and then the second part uh, that really speaks to me is uh, it seems to me that governments clearly need to be doing more to create the conditions in which, you know, that human creativity and ingenuity can thrive. Um, you know, we can set the market economy loose to create uh, new solutions to our challenges if the right incentives are there. Um, you know, we have plenty of evidence throughout uh, human history, and especially in the last century, of how when government and industries are pushing towards the same goals uh, and rowing in the same direction, those big changes can happen very, very quickly. So, of course, that uh, takes political will, um, and that's uh, a significant polit political will, but it is possible um, and will be increasingly possible um, as this coalition of circular economy uh, enthusiasts continues to grow um, through events such as this one. Thanks, Bo. And and I, I agree that, that your point and Max's point about the importance of public-private partnership and also community partnership so that we don't see a transition to circular, circularity as top down, but, but actively engage stakeholders at every part of the value chain and that it's community centered is, is just going to be so critical. So 
there's there's a lot more to discuss. And at this point, I think it would be great to hear from our audience and to give our panelists the opportunity to, to answer some questions. So I think we can open up the, the Q&A and, and go ahead and, and take some of those audience questions. And so I know that the, the process is to upvote the questions. Just trying to be able to see the questions. So please continue to enter some questions and, and vote on the questions and then we'll we'll share them with the group based on the votes. <clears throat> so everybody, I, I, I'll start with my own question as, as we tee up the, the questions from the audience, um, which is really that there's there's been so much that's been shared today across a, a really an ideal vision for all of the things that need to be in place for a transition to circularity to be all the things we want it to be, to, to be just, inclusive, accessible, equitable. And, and I would say, if I could hear from our panelists and, and from Bo, what struck you as the most compelling that we need to move ahead on first? If you had to choose one thing that was the first next step, please chime in with, with your answers on what you think would rise to the top. I can make a start. I mean, I, I don't know if it's, if it's the first in terms of order of timing, but I certainly think that engaging children and young people um, on the topic is absolutely important. And I think it follows one of the comments that's making on uh, that's made on the board there that I can see around circular economy being taught in, in, in schools. As I mentioned, the, the piece of work we did around circular economy and young people with over 6,000 People, you know, overwhelmingly children said they were, you know, 37% strongly agreed that they wanted a job that didn't harm the environment. 90% uh, said they wanted a job that was focused on improving the environment. I think showing children um, the types of jobs, and I think you only, you can only be what you can see. And, and I think you need to be able to see those jobs, understand those jobs, understand how the circular economy um, it works. And I think, you know, it also probably the first thing we can do then on that continuum is start with, uh, with, with teachers and, and bring, bring the circular economy concepts that they're, they're relatively at the highest level, they're relatively straightforward concepts to understand. Um, and of, you can use Lego bricks, but you can use lots of things to, to explain how materials need to stay in this, uh, virtuous circle. Um, and I think the role of influences we found again from that study is just huge. That parents and teachers are the greatest influences on on ch for children on on circularity. And um, I, I think if we can start there, if we can make some of those things come alive for for children, we will definitely see uh, the results in in the not too distant future, both through uh, children um, as I did when I was a child, and those who with with children will know is. It, children badgering and pestering their parents is is certainly the immediate reaction that it has and then of course a longer term um embedding of circularity in in those behaviors of those future um leaders and uh teachers and uh parents and uh uh police officers and uh, of, uh you know the, the adults of the future quite clearly are, are are those children and that's that's who i think we need to engage as soon as possible can I um, add to that? I mean, the Education International, our global teachers union, we stand with them for their call to demand uh, climate curriculum in the schools, because this is, in fact, uh, you know, as Tim says, going to create not just a consciousness in the way we live our lives, but it will be the, the foundations for the future engineers and the business people and the carers in our world and all of those who really do need to uh, 
you know, to take this forward. But in the meantime, if you go back to the debate on trade, you know, we talk about putting uh, human and labour rights and traceability to, uh, you know, through mandated due diligence in supply chains. But as well as looking at what uh, transparency means for, uh, you know, um, exploitation and avoiding exploitation and ensuring remedy, if we did that with product materials as well, if the transparency was there through the traceability of the, the production and the supply chains, then indeed you would have the start of a business plan that says, can we do this better? Can we actually change the way we do this? What's the waste impact of, uh, of this kind of purchasing uh, and this kind of production? So transparency for me absolutely is also part of an educational piece if you seriously want to put circular economy principles at the heart of business planning with people and the planet in the centre of that. Thanks, Sharon and Tim. And I think that, that that focus on transparency leads directly into one of our top questions, which is about the role of the banking and financing industry and how that needs to change in, in an urgent way to support the circular economy in, industry and, and invest in that versus the linear industry. And the question is, how can this be achieved at an international level? I, I suspect, Max, this is directed at you, so would love to hear your thoughts, but please, everyone else chime in as, as they desire. No, thanks for, for the question, for sure. Just to add to the previous point, of course, uh, education is key and also transparency. I would say to shift onto the conversation just from waste management, usually to innovation, to creativity, to design, which is actually more evocative and also engaging even for young generations and and uh, um, and uh, uh, creative uh, uh, creative people. In terms of uh, what the financial industry can do in order to be seen as a supporting factor for the circular economy transition, no doubt that uh, the financial uh, uh, sector does have a pivotal role to be uh, not somehow ahead of the curve and not just waiting somehow for major developments to, to, to happen. There is, of course, a, a strict regulation in place for the financial services, so there is also the, the need for uh, um, adjustments in the regulation in order for the financial services to be fully somehow available for the circular transition, but not to escape from the question, I can share what we at Intesa San Paolo have been doing. We have been somehow already back in 2018 um, co-designing this uh, uh, six euro billion credit facility, which is a standard credit, so nothing very complicated. But we wanted to make sure that we would be able to uh, concrete support the transition. And in doing so, we have been designing accession criteria to those uh, credit lines through the close participation with the LM Cartoon Foundation, of which we are the first bank as a strategic partner since 2016. And so in doing so, we wanted to somehow show the way that we wanted to be responsible in addressing the transition, uh, doing our own part first, for sure. And we have been also being able to do so also after uh, disseminating the organization across our entire organization the right concept about circularity. And you can believe me, that has not been an easy task for a financial institution to be fully engaged as we are on this kind of topic. On the second point, for sure, there is the need for somehow being cooperative with other financial institutions and creating somehow the appetite for um, the sort of market to be receptive of uh, solutions that not have to be very complicated, but can really have innovation as a key component compared to standard investments. And I believe also that fresh regulation coming out from the European institutions in the last years and also in the next coming months will somehow, uh, again, pave the way for additional support from the financial sector in doing so. Just as I was mentioning before, the European Investment Bank has been uh, uh, somehow evolving its own mandate to become the climate bank, and they have been uh, pretty vocal about the necessity to step up the commitment as well in order to support the climate agenda with the amount up to 1 trillion from now to 2030. So I would say that at least 
those two experiences from the private sector, from our perspective, for sure, and the public sector as well, as an European, as I was saying in the beginning, are really testimony of the fact that financial industry is actually very active in supporting the transition. There is also the possibility that uh, um, investors do really buy into this new concept. We have been very successful in uh, placing a sustainability bond focused on circular economy back in 2019, 750 million euros uh, bond, very well received by the market. So we believe that uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, still room for improvement, for sure. There is a, a gr great collaboration and cooperation, a global call for circular economy. But again, and I do close here, I believe that also in order to be very effective as a financial industry, as a collective system, as a, a platform for enabling business, there is also the need of coherence in terms of terminology. Sustainability is a tremendous important concept, but we also need to, 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 to face the reality that actually sustainability wanted to make the actual system more sustainable. Circularity actually wants to go beyond. Circularity aims to change the model, not just make the existing more uh, sustainable. So in this direction, if we all go uh, and in end, in terms of the uh, clear strategic direction, I guess that even more players from the financial industry will buy into the concept and they will see, as uh, you mentioned, the research that we've been carrying out with Bocconi University is showing that businesses that are embracing clear business models that are inspired by circular economy principles do have a better risk profile um, uh, return, um, a risk return profile. So uh, we really are trying to uh, make sure that the financial industry does have a business case to support the investments and the financing of the circular economy. But of course, this cannot be done by uh, only some players in the industry. It's the industry that can really step up its commitment and make sure that the transition is truly global as it has to be. Thanks, Max. I, I totally agree. There needs to be a convergence of all of these interests that have been expressed by, by all of our panelists and, and speakers today. And there's so much more we, we could discuss, but we're at time now. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for your very thoughtful insights. And I look forward to seeing how all of us can collaboratively continue to translate theory into action in advancing an inclusive and just circular economy. Thanks everyone for your for your thoughts today. And Catherine, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Well, Chuk, we've come to the closing session for the WCEF 2021. And we were just talking in the hallway a while ago thinking, wow, I wonder if we're sending the message that we're not paying attention to social distancing. We want to shout out to all of the people who have been here in our studio in Mississauga, Ontario, for taking such good care of us. We have all been masked. We've got sanitation. We've got um, people running around just making sure that everything is safe. We are very aware that we're still in the middle of a global pandemic. It's affecting Canada. It's affecting every country around the world. And we just want to signal that we're paying attention to these things too. And we're at the end of our time together, believe it or not. I don't believe it. <laughs> it is. I am shocked and surprised, honestly, that um, the time has gone so quickly. Mm. Yeah, we've raced through and there's been so many incredible people who we've come and gone with, including the guests that we are very excited to bring back onto the stage with us right now. <laughs> Alina, please. Oh. Alina, it's <laughs> a pleasure. Oh, what a pleasure. Welcome back. We can't hear you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. OK, now we can hear you. Great. Again, Alina, to the bar, please do walk us through the graphic that you've, uh, you've created from today. OK, it was really hard to choose uh, key points in the graphic. There were a lot of highlights to the day. Um, but I think that it comes down to les faut changer notre façon d'affaires. 
euh, notre façon de produire, notre façon de... A new way of producing, a new way of questioning what we consume. Yes, and they spoke about transparency and how maybe if products and companies give us the information to um, what the product went through and uh, you know we are able to make ethical decisions uh, there was something also that i think it has come up um, again and again about how we should just deconstruct what we know and reconnect with uh, indigenous ways of knowing they have been doing this for a long time and we have a lot to learn so we don't have to reinvent what it's been done um, and we have to start seeing nature as an extension of us instead of like something we have to attend to somehow at one point um, i think a lot of us think by recycling we're doing the right thing and it came up a lot today that it should be our last resource and how you know there's a lot of things that can come before and how we should try to eliminate waste and pollution, uh, circulate products and materials, and regenerate nature. So also to move farther than just carbon footprint and think about nature, deforestation, and how to be nature positive. Nous avons bien de chemin. We really have a long way to go. In it. Incroyable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. First of all, I noticed in that uh, graph there's a circle around the world fashion. And uh, with uh, Catherine also, I noticed that there's a little circle in on what you're wearing. There's these circles. Well, visually aligned. Yeah. And we were thinking in, in this way that there's so many things we can do small and large mm -hmm. to participate in the circle and to participate in. So if we look at Chuck's feet <laughs> um, as well, these are special order shoes. What's the story? Yeah, so um, these shoes are made by a Canadian-based company and um, they are made with, um, with leftover coconut uh, shedding, the, the outside wow. of a coconut, the coconut husk. So they made with the leftover the coconut husk and they're made with bamboo um, to cover the top. And uh, as we all sort of know, bamboo is the more environmental alternative of cotton. It grows faster. Um, it needs less water in the, in the fabrication process. And so it just shows the many different ways um, circularity can be incorporated into what we wear as we kind of learned from one of our case studies in the rural and remote community session. And if you now look at Catherine's feet, because we're, <laughs> if we're gonna be we're looking gonna at people's feet, there's multiple people here. If we can stare at Catherine's feet. Catherine, please tell us the stories behind that shoe. So these are um, the, the, the well-known shoe fellow in Vancouver, uh, John Fluvog. And these are old shoes that I took to the cobbler and said, can we buff them up? And maybe, and he got these fancy laces and said, you know, these can represent the ocean. Here you go. And so, it, and all the clothing is clothing that we've worn. And we're just trying to sort of signal that small gestures. So the story of the dress is... Well, I just, I wanted to be aligned with uh, our topic and the visuals, but talking about fashion and dress, um, Martina and Testino actually inspire me because I think that a lot of times, especially like we are wearing something and we have a stain on it and our first reaction is just to throw it out. But I was like, you know what? I could just uh, taint it, paint it, even paint on it. I could like tell a story with the way I dress and make a statement with the way I dress. So I'm wearing circles today to be aligned with what we're talking about. And <laughs> J'adore, mais en effet, ça souligne à quel I love it. And it really underlines to how a point this integrates everything. ...of this phenomenal forum, but it's not just something that we're doing as a job, right? It's something that we are trying our best to integrate into our lives and to support systems that do highlight the circularity. This, this blazer, made by Canadian-based company, uh, made in Canada. These pants, same thing, Canadian-based company, made in Canada. And so it's, it's these small things that we start accumulating and... Um, really trying to do our best to create, to support ethical, circular economies that support the people that we care about in our communities. Okay. Thank Absolutely. you, Alina, for being with us. Thank you for sharing your beautiful words and your art, and we wish you the best. And, it's been uh, my absolute pleasure. Take good care.
Thank you. Now we're going to be joined by Alice Henry. I know you as the Senior Project Coordinator with Share, Reuse, Repair, but today you have a different job and we thank you so much for saying yes to us. You are a rapporteur. You've watched every session, you were paying attention to every single thing. What are your main takeaways, Alice? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, it's been an exciting and engaging two days that have clearly laid out the challenges we must overcome, but also the multitude of ways we can pursue a circular economy that can benefit people and planet. Uh, and thank you, Alina, for capturing the past two days in such a visually engaging way. I'm joining today from the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, currently known as Vancouver. We have heard time and again over these past two days that circularity is not a new concept, but still a vital one to the well-being of our communities, both human and not. The world we find ourselves in touts layers of complexity, and yet people across the world are also connected by more than ever before, be it through virtual connections, vast supply chains, or values that transcend cultures, geography, and language. That is our first step in this journey after all understanding that which binds us and the systemic hurdles that can be more easily overcome through collaboration. Game changers cannot thrive in isolation. As Carol Ann Hilton said in her address, a return to circularity can be looked at as a chance to return to humanity itself. Many of you are familiar with Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics, but what I often find myself referencing even more is her model of the embedded economy which nests the economy within society and within the living world while recognizing the diverse ways in which it can meet people's needs and wants. Over the past decades, many lifestyles and the systems that support them have evolved to prioritize speed, convenience, and more, more, more. Those of us who have been working in this field for years have surely questioned when the breakneck pace of development might slow or when public opinion would begin to pump the brakes long enough for other visions of a better life, a better future, and better systems to uphold them might take root. We're now seeing that happen, and we're seeing young leaders at the helm pushing these conversations forward in their homes, their schools, their communities, and on the world stage. We've heard from our speakers that the costs of a linear economy have disproportionately burdened communities of color across the world, and it's time that these communities are not only invited to the table, but that their needs are centered in the conversation and they are given the lead to change the course. Let's be humble in our approach to collaboration. After all, we do not know what we do not know. We do not all need to be experts on every single aspect. Let people share their lived experience and lead action in their communities. The circular economy can not only empower people to take action for a better society and to mitigate climate change, but the circular economy can also create inclusive jobs and make goods and services more affordable and accessible. These qualities can make a transition to the next economy more just and prosperous, though we need to keep in mind that a circular economy does not inherently guarantee justice and inclusivity. So we need to keep those goals at the forefront of our minds. We have also heard that a circular economy is a return to nature that beyond preserving the values of resources, we have the opportunity to regenerate and replenish our natural systems. These systems are not only critical to our own well-being, but to the many species we share this planet with. We need to think beyond our current borders and boundaries to realize fully circular systems rather than standalone circular solutions. We will need to make changes, both incremental and systemic, as individuals and as a collective. Everyone is engaged in the circular economy, as we've heard. It just might look different for different people. The reasons, the motivations behind their actions might not be linked to circularity or even to sustainability, but everyone still engages in the circular economy. What we need to ask is how the circular economy eases the challenges people in our communities are facing. What are the other ways we might frame the circular economy outside of sustainability? Living in harmony with nature and in an economy that prioritizes human well-being should be anything but dull. Adopting circularity can fill our lives with joy, experiences, and connection. Action can take many forms, changing our behaviors, changes in regulations and policy, innovation to solve gaps in the problem space, or voluntarily exploring what we can do better. 
We can acknowledge that it is not choosing one or the other, but a mosaic of these actions that will bring us closer to our goals. As we approach tomorrow's accelerator sessions, I want to echo the remarks made by Professor Ishii on day one. It's time to raise ambitions. We have a pretty good idea of the road that lies ahead of us, and it's not easy. Most of the changes we need to see have to be made in the next five years. However, today we have more avenues by which to get there. Agile SMEs and cross-sectoral collaborations are demonstrating what our future can look like. And we're starting to see the finance sector shift towards supporting their efforts. We can mimic natural systems in our innovations, and we can honor and uplift indigenous peoples and the traditional land-based knowledge they have learned over time immemorial within our pursuits. We can pivot from an economy focused on growth to an economy focused on rich ecosystems and vibrant full lives. I come to events, I think like many people, uh, for the fire I feel in my stomach afterwards. I get reinvigorated to not just do the work I show up for every day, but to do the work not being done to fill the gaps I see in my community. As you all discuss outcomes and how to get there in the accelerator sessions tomorrow, consider what actually needs to happen to change the game and who needs to be alongside us to make it happen. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Alice. It was a very clear sort of summary of our two days, and that was also a very clear call to action. So I thank you for that. Thank you very much, Alice. Before we bring our first two days to a close, I would like to welcome back two co-organizers for the WCEF 2021 event to provide some of their closing remarks. First, we have Yerki Katainen, the president of Citra. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here again. I would first like to thank everyone who contributed for the WCF 2021. Speakers, participants, and partners. And a special thanks to Environment and Climate Change Canada for co-hosting this event. This has been a great journey for us. During the past two days, it has become clear that despite the challenges of COVID-19, we have moved forward. Regional and global alliances are here and awareness has increased. But action is needed now to reach the systemic change. The WCF 2021 has brought out important calls to action. 2021 is an important year for climate and biodiversity. Circular economy is an economically and socially viable tool to tackle the major ecological crises and rebuild natural capital. We must all take responsibility and lead the change from citizens to business leaders and decision makers. All voices must be heard. And it is important to prioritize those who are in the most vulnerable position in the circular transition. The circular economy needs businesses of different sizes. SMEs are flexible, agile, and good at product design, which is crucial for successful circular business models. The natural resource sector has a lot to gain from circularity. And global corporates that adopt circularity into their business models can scale the transition effectively. The journey of WCF will continue and I hope every one of you will be part of it. Mainstreaming the circular economy is a necessity and an opportunity. Thank you. And for the prochaine, uh and uh, now we will be uh, listening to the uh, Deputy Minister for Environment and Change, Calida Christine Hogan. For the introduction, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to join you again from Ottawa on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. The Canada se réjouit d'être le premier hôte. Canada is happy to be the first North American host of this forum. It's the contribution of our co-organizer, the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra. I also want to thank our partners and collaborators here in Canada and around the world. As the first two days of the World Circular Economy Forum come to a close, I hope what we have heard during our sessions together will carry us forward with renewed energy. 
Nous nous sommes réunis en tant que... We met as business leaders, deciders and experts to focus on what we have called game change, things to change, that is the transformation and all measures that must be taken to help grow the circular economy in the world. More sustainable approaches to production and consumption that will fuel our future prosperity. Continuing this momentum is important. Expanding partnerships between governments, industry, nonprofits, researchers, civil society, youth, and others are also important. Nous devons mettre à profit le. We must to use all the work done during this forum and during all other world forums for a circular economy. Otherwise said, we must. Um, realize our ambitions on the economic and social plan. The importance of collaboration in the pursuit of shared goals because the work goes on. Tomorrow, there are more than 20 accelerator sessions organized by partners and collaborators. I encourage you to participate in these sessions. Thank you again for your participation. Merci encore pour votre... Thank you for your participation. Citra and Environment Canada, uh, Environment Climate Change Canada. The climate change is an important part of it. It is, and it, uh, <laughs> those words have not been in that title for that long, have they now? That is actually quite true. It's mm -hmm. actually a new, uh, it's a new addition. That's a very important point. Um, what are your two takeaways, Catherine? Oh, there's uh, so many takeaways, but the two key ones would be that. Um, everyone being more intentional mm -hmm. about what they're doing in mm -hmm. terms of um, making decisions in the world as they go and then listening um, learning to listen better learning to include more people at the table and then share ideas and ways of knowing to make good choices for the future that is magical i think i actually have the same takeaways so my two takeaways are very much one the idea of governance i think throughout this entire uh, two days, we've seen the importance of leadership at the highest levels and really being able to support people. From our very first session, where we heard um, Aaron from Impact Zero Toronto mention the difficulties that um, business people face in trying to create uh, circular bu uh, business models through regulations and whatnot, to the sessions we've just finished hearing all about banking regulations and what's available as financing. So really sort of that governance piece is such a key component but then the other piece is partnerships, which really goes back to what you just said about um, listening to people, right? Creating true partnerships, not just between sectors. I mean, I, obviously, I mean sectors as well, public, private, um, nonprofit. But then I also mean between people, partnerships between people of various cultures, various identities, and various ways of being. Most of us come from countries that have multiple cultures. Um, there are very, very few monocultural countries in the world remaining. And so that ability to sort of interact between the cultures and make sure everyone feels welcome and um, like tout le monde se sent à leur place, à la table. The fact that everybody feels that they have a uh, spot at the table and felt um, listened to, that's very important as a takeaway. The nations represented. Um, so many people checking in, checking out of, of the time together, it really sort of opens up possibilities. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the people who are invisible to all of you uh, watching, the people who made this uh, event go off without a hitch. We touched on the cleaners earlier, those people who kept everybody uh, sanitized and clean so that we can be careful during this time together, the people who looked after content, streaming, all the systems people, translation, um, people who did technical transmission, our technical studio, we got a dancer on camera three, we got Richard over on uh, the microphones, we've got Riley running the floor. We have just been so well cared for and it's just it's been such a pleasure and you are a gift. So thank you so, so much for spending this time with me. No, mais merci beaucoup à toi aussi, puis merci. Thank you to you too, and thank you to the team who really helped um, to make this a smooth ride for all of us. And who made sure that we had, well, uh, moi, like moi j'avais comme le chocolat. I had a hot chocolate every morning. As, as per my necklace. So really sort of making sure that I am well fed, hydrated, and have the energy to be with you for two days non-stop of jam-packed learning. So as we close off and as we sort of come to an end, Catherine, I would like you to give every single viewer and everyone who watches this recording a challenge. A challenge. Change your way. Do something different. One thing. 
one thing that is different and one thing that will intentionally move you into a circular approach to your life? Amazing. My challenge is going to be a little bit more dramatic. So I'm <laughs> really? <with> you. <laughs> I, I'm shocked. I, I want to start off by saying <laughs> I'm a very non-dramatic person. So let's, let's begin with that. But in recognizing that we're mainly speaking to Canada right now because everyone else is asleep uh, due to our time zones, uh, my challenge echoes the words of Sophia Yang from yesterday. As the most multicultural country in the world, I challenge you to ensure that every conference you organize, every project you lead, every company you run, and every movement that you champion is as diverse as the people of our nation. With that, j'ai le grand plaisir de faire and I have the great pleasure now to uh, close the forum, our two-day forum today, with the talented uh, students of the Alison Bernard Memorial School and the members of the Eskasoni First Nation community. My name is Tuk Adinabara, and it was a pleasure to be UMC. My name is Kretzinger.